Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Dean, Professors, ladies and gentlemen. The title of my talk is Advances in Chemical Sensing Using Supercontinuum Light. And here's the outline. I will first briefly describe how to generate supercontinuum light in optical fibers. Then I will go over to some applications, like how to do very fast spectroscopy, where the speed actually is limited by the uncertainty principle. And then at the end, some applications for atmospheric trace gas sensing and also some liquid phase analytics. So the most typical way to generate supercontinuum light is to take a monochromatic laser pulse and launch that into a nonlinear optical fiber where several nonlinear phenomena take place and the output is a supercontinuum where the single narrow color is massively broadened into a range of colors and typically a supercontinuum covers all the visible colors and most of the near infrared parts. And the real enabling step towards practical supercontinuum sources was the realization of the photonic crystal fiber around the year 2000. And in a typical PCF used for supercontinuum generation, we have a solid core surrounded by a honeycomb-like cladding layer. And there are two major differences over single mode, standard single mode fibers. First of all, the core can be made very small, down to one micrometer or below, meaning that we can increase the intensity and therefore enhance the nonlinear effects. The other thing is that we can tailor the dispersion properties of this fiber, meaning that we can control how different colors propagate, how fast they propagate in, in the core. And the application of photonic crystal fibers led to the 2005 Nobel Prize in Physics on high precision uh, spectroscopy and frequency metrology. So why supercontinuous sources are good for spectroscopy? First, spectral bandwidth. It covers all the colors from the visible blue 400 nanometers down to 2.5 micrometers in the infrared. It's spectrally really bright. The total output power can be several watts of optical power, and the spectral brightness can be several milliwatts per nanometer. Uh, it's spatially coherent because the light comes out from a single mode fiber. It can, it can be focused down to the diffraction limit. So it's very useful for microscopy. And more importantly, there are already commercial turnkey systems available. And there are established numerical models. So we can predict what kind of continuum we get after, after the nonlinear fiber. And I won't go into the details, but the numerical simulation involves solving the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And that equation takes into account uh, phenomena like classical dispersion, self-phase modulation, cross-phase modulation, Raman scattering, four-way mixing, and soliton dynamics. And in this animation, you see initially a monochromatic few picosecond pulse. And the spectrum of this starts to broaden massively as we propagate along the fiber. And maybe the thing to note here, here we see these light packages or solitons whose shape and intensity remain over large distances in the fiber. And through four-way mixing, uh, the, or part of this energy in the solitons is fed into the so-called dispersive waves. So the solitons form the long wavelength edge of the supercontinuum and the dispersive waves, they form the short wavelength edge of the supercontinuum. And then a side note, uh, there have been seafarers telling stories that sometimes they see, see gigantic waves appear from nothing when, when they are trolling or transporting stuff from, from Europe to US, for example. And 
it's not really well known why these gigantic waves appear suddenly. But interestingly, the same ha thing happens in supercontinuum generation. Every 10,000 pulse or less, there are solitons that are more redshifted than the others, and the intensity can be 30 to 40 times higher than the average soliton intensity. And these are called rogue solitons. And, of course, they are interesting from the theoretical point of view. The same mathematical tools can be used to predict the ocean rogue waves and the optical rogue waves. But to understand what's going on here may help to find out reasons why some optical components get damaged or fiber optic system stops working. And they also explain why the edges of the supercontinuum are more unstable than the center part. So let's move over to applications. How can we do very fast spectroscopy? So let's take a picosecond fiber laser. It's off the shelf component. And we take that spectrally narrow and temporally narrow pulse and launch it through a supercontinuum fiber. So first we broaden the spectrum of the pulse. Then we take, let's say, 50 kilometers of standard telecom fiber and the dispersion of that fiber it spreads the pulse in the time domain. And now all we need to do is we take this pulse through our sample and we can use, I mean, this is the beauty of this technique. We just use a single photodiode and high-speed oscilloscope to record the full spectrum in a very short piece of time. And once the pulse is going through the sample, we start to observe these absorption peaks due to whatever is there that we want to analyze. And from this, we can calculate the spectrum. And this is an uh, example of a raw supercontinuum pulse launched through a methane flame. So there you start to see the absorption lines of methane and water vapor. And we can remove the back, background or the envelope. And what we do here, because we know the dispersion properties of our dispersive fiber, we can map this time domain picture back into the spectral domain, so we get the spectrum as a function of wavelength. And note that the whole pul pulse is less than one microsecond long, and the scanning speed is actually limited by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, because we can't measure energies or spectra, I mean, as fast as we would like to. There's a limit, and we are close to that limit with this technique. So here you see an example of methane measurement the laser rep rate was 1.1 megahertz. Each frame is an average of 20 spectra, so the effective acquisition rate is 55 kilohertz. So we get the full spectrum 55,000 times a second. And it's clear that this kind of analytical tool has applications in reaction kinetic studies in internal combustion engines, for example. We can measure the exhaust gases as a function of crank angle. Or we can study fuel cells, flames, you just name it. So that was about speed. Can we do sensitive measurements? And the answer is that yes, we can. So what we did, we took a supercontinuum source. We coupled the light between two highly reflective mirrors. So the idea here is that the photons bounce back and forth between the two mirrors, and that increases the absorption length. So at best, we can get about 20 kilometers absorption length in a uh, one meter physical cavity. And then we just analyze the transmitted light using a standard spectrometer. Okay, let's skip that. So this is a raw data signal when the, nit or the cavity is flushed with nitrogen, so there's no absorption. And then we introduce our sample. We start to see the absorption dips here. And from these two, signals, we can calculate the absorption spectrum. And we started this work by collaborating with some atmospheric chemists, and they were interested in species like NO2, NO3. Uh, let me elaborate this a bit more. Here we have only 38 parts per trillion of NO3, so that's tiny concentration. Uh, PPT 10 to minus 12 volume fraction. And by analyzing this, the red is the actual measured curve, black line is a reference from database, 
and the blue line is the residual between these two. And it turns out the sensitivity or the detection limit is close to one parts per trillion using just one second integration time. So that's one second measurement time. And I don't have time to show you more example how we can do multi-species sensing. So we can detect multiple species simultaneously because of the broadband nature of our light source. And that has been not possible before, before such studies. And the final application is uh, liquid phase sensing. So it's the same experimental setup, but now we add a liquid phase cuvette between the two mirrors. So we can do liquid phase analytics. And actually in this figure, you see there's a bit of fluorescing dye in the cuvette. This is about five centimeters long cuvette. And the green light is being emitted from the fluorescing dye. The laser beam excites the dye there. And we can get up to six to, or five to six meter absorption length inside the liquid. So that's a factor of five to 600 better than in a stand, standard one centimeter cuvette. So I would say that this is approaching a super spectrophotometer that every chemist, chemistry lab has. Uh, the sample volume can be still kept below one milliliter, and full spectra can be acquired at best using 10 microsecond exposure time and at 600 hertz rep rate, meaning that we can do reaction kinetic studies within this cell at very high sensitivity. And here you see some examples of alexafluor dye measured at nanomolar concentration levels. Just to show you how to study reaction, how this can be applied to reaction kinetic studies, we studied a chemical clock reaction where the color of this stuff changes from blue to red in a periodic fashion. And, okay, let me try to make that animation work. Yeah. So here we can measure the whole 300 nanometer band in a fraction of a second and follow how this chemical clock propagates, how the reaction kinetics behave and so forth. Okay, here the reaction rate is fairly slow. It takes about 30 seconds to change the color. But as said, we can do much faster if, if needed. Right. So as a conclusion, super continuum sources allow for exciting new uh, lines of inquiry in analytical applications, and I just showed you a few examples how we can do very high speed measurements and how we can really exploit the broad bandwidth of supercontinuum sources. And there are a whole bunch of applications, ranging from atmospheric trace gas studies. I don't have to, or I, I don't unfortunately have time to discuss exhaled breath analytics, which is a very topical uh, field in this business. So the basic idea is that there are certain diseases that can be diagnosed by just studying the breath or the gases we exhale. And tools like this, they have the sensitivity and this multi-species capability. So it's fairly clear that in the future there will be analytical instrumentation that can just, or they can detect some diseases just by breathing in into the apparatus. And finally, where we are now, so we are now working how to calibrate the cavity-enhanced measurement. Because if we use a two-mirror cavity, the question is how many times the photons bounce back and forwards between the two mirrors. And we are working on a technique called broadband cavity ring-down spectroscopy, which is inherently a self-calibrated technique. So we know exactly what's the absorption length in the spectrometer. Then we also investigate how can we expand the existing supercontinuum towards uh, shorter wavelengths to UV and also to the mid-IR, where most gases have the fundamental absorption lines and the uh, highest absorption strengths. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge my co-workers and the funding bodies 
And then I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Tony. Any comments? Questions? This one at the back. There? Okay. Yeah, thanks for the good talk. It was quite interesting. I was just wondering, what's the physical size of an instrument done with this for atmospheric trace gas analysis? How small can you make it? Yeah, we Any have idea about? Yeah, we have typically used one meter absorption cavity. So it depends really what sensitivity you are aiming at. Okay. So we got about 20 kilometer absorption length in a size like this. But you, if you can deal with less, I guess you can make it a desktop PC-sized instrument easily. Yeah, thanks. That but answered not, my not, question. Not a mobile phone yet. Yeah. That's a future vision of, of some people that if you just breathe in into your Nokia whatever model, it will uh, print you a recipe that you take to the nearby pharmacy store and you are, you are done. Okay. There was another one. Over there. Thank you for a very nice presentation. How are your findings now being developed towards commercial applications and by whom? <clears throat> yeah, that's a very good question. The commercial supercontinuum sources are still quite pricey. Uh, the, the cheapest systems are, let's say, at least a few thousand euros. But, yeah, it really depends. If you want to cover all the visible colors and the near-infrared, it's going to be expensive. And it may be a bit difficult to, to commercialize systems like that. But on the other hand, for gas phase sensing, as an example, you can generate a continuum in a standard single-mode fiber, which costs maybe 10 euros, or sorry, 10 centimeters, 10 cents per meter or so. So that costs nothing. And the near-infrared region is ideal for gas phase sensing. So from the light source's point of view, I would say that at, at best you can do with a few hundred euros. And of course there are clear commercial interests in these technologies. And without going into the details, there are already cavity ring down systems that are very close to this and they are commercially available in instruments. Price level being around 40, 50K. Okay, any other? If no, then thanks again. Thank